What's up, beautiful people? Welcome to Joe's Productions. In this video, I will quickly review the topic of the Constitutional Convention and debates over ratification. As we saw in our last video, there were a lot of difficulties under the Articles of Confederation. These challenges led to calls for a stronger central government, and delegates from the states met at the Constitutional Convention in, in Philadelphia to try to figure this thing out. In total, 55 delegates attended the Constitutional Convention from May to September of 1787. And check the image, you could see we got some big names in this room. The delegates decided pretty early on to replace the articles rather than to attempt to revise it. And in the effort to develop a new constitution, delegates negotiated, collaborated, and ultimately compromised with one another. One of the big issues that came up at the Constitutional Convention was how political representation for the states in the federal government would be determined. Factions emerged early on, large states are one group, and they have a very different set of ideas than the small states. Remember, the Articles of Confederation created a one-branch government. There was no executive branch under the Articles. They were worried about creating a position that would exercise power like a king would. Instead, they just had a legislative branch. Congress consisted of a unicameral legislature with each state having only one representative. At the convention, small states wanted to maintain the equal representation of the Articles of Confederation. At the convention, the New Jersey Plan proposed a unicameral legislature with each state having the same number of representatives. While a plan that calls for equal representatives for all states sounds like it would be fair, large states like Virginia, which had a lot more people, felt this proposal was completely unfair. Remember, these representatives of the legislative branch will eventually make the laws. Large states like Virginia, with a population of over 700,000 people felt it was absurd that they would get the same number of votes as a state such as Delaware that had less than 100,000 people. Large states supported the Virginia plan that called for a bicameral legislator with representation being determined by population. The more people in the state, the more representatives that state would get. Both the Virginia and New Jersey plans were proposals for how states would be represented in the legislative branch. As a result of negotiation and compromise, Amongst the delegates, the Great Compromise was adopted. This deal established a bicameral legislature. Representation in the lower house, the House of Representatives, would be based upon population. The more people you have, the more representatives you would get for your state in the house. Every 10 years, the population would be counted in the census, and adjustments to representation would be made accordingly. In the upper house, the Senate, each state would have equal representation. This equal representation was similar to what was under the Articles, but instead of one representative per state, each state would get two. Now, in order for a law to be passed by Congress, it has to pass both houses of Congress. The next big issue at the convention was over the issue of slavery. Now, nowhere in the Constitution does the word slave or slavery appear, yet various protections were put in place to protect slavery. Southern delegates wanted their enslaved population to be counted in the count that determined representation in Congress. Since states like Virginia and South Carolina had a large number of enslaved people, they would get more representatives if those numbers were included in the count. States without a large population of enslaved people felt enslaved people should not be counted when determining representation in Congress. Slaveholders considered those they enslaved property, so it made no sense to include them in the count. Whether or not enslaved people would be counted for the purpose of determining representation in Congress split northern and southern delegates. Southern delegates threatened to walk out of the Constitutional Convention over this issue, but ultimately negotiation and compromise would be achieved in the form of the three-fifths compromise. The three-fifths compromise dealt with the issue of how enslaved people would be counted towards congressional representation. The three-fifths compromise stated that enslaved people would be counted three-fifths of a person for representation purposes in the House of Representatives. As a result of this compromise, Southern power in the House of Representatives was increased, but not as much as they would have liked. While some delegates wanted the international slave trade to end immediately, at the Constitutional Convention, the delegates decided to not prohibit the international slave trade until after 1808. In other words, the transatlantic slave trade was extended for 20 years in the Constitution. Keep in mind, they did not place any restrictions on the very lucrative internal slave trade within the United States. And in the Constitution, there was 
also a fugitive slave clause. Although, like the rest of the Constitution, the words slave or slavery do not appear, the clause was intended to return enslaved people who escape from a slave state to a free state to their lawful owner. And it is important to note the three-fifths compromise and other provisions on slavery in the Constitution were designed to protect the economic interest of slaveholders. And as a result, various compromises would be made. And even at the Constitutional Convention, differences over slavery emerge between the North and the South. Those differences will only intensify as debates about the expansion of slavery eventually came to dominate the political debate in the new nation. Foreshadowing. Once the delegates were done drafting the proposed constitution, a debate over ratification took place. The new constitution was sent to the states for ratification, and in order for the new government to go into effect, nine out of the 13 states had to ratify. Right away, factions developed over the issue of ratification. Anti-Federalists opposed ratification of the constitution. The concern of anti-Federalists was that the new constitution put too much power into the hands of a centralized national government. Anti-Federalists wanted wanted a Bill of Rights added and additional support for state rights. The Federalists, on the other hand, supported ratification of the Constitution. They felt this new national government was a vast improvement over the Articles of Confederation. To try to increase support for ratification, the Federalist Papers were written by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay. The goal of the Federalist Papers was to convince those reluctant to support ratification of the Constitution to change their minds. The essays explain the advantages of a strong federal government to increase support for ratification of the Constitution, Federalists promised to add a Bill of Rights that enumerated individual rights and explicitly restricted the powers of the federal government. You could see the order of ratification on the map. Fun fact, if you are ever in... Hi, I'm in Delaware. You will know that Delaware was the first state to ratify the Constitution, something they are very proud of. States such as Massachusetts agreed to ratify the Constitution only after they were promised that a Bill of Rights would be added not too long after ratification. And this addition of the Bill of Rights will get enough states on board and the Constitution will go into effect. However, we will have to wait until our next video to learn about what is exactly in this new document. Until next time, thank you so much for watching Jost Productions. Have a beautiful day. Peace.